But when I started the redress campaign with the JECL, I realized that there were various functions that we needed to accomplish, one of which was um, that we had to get past all the cultural walls and obstacles we had built in front of and around ourselves. And part of the process was for Japanese Americans expiating the, the guilt that we felt because of what we had experienced. My name is Grace Shimizu and um, I serve as the uh, director of the Japanese Peruvian Oral History Project and the director of the uh, Campaign for Justice, Redress Now for Japanese Latin Americans. And I'm also the project director of the updated traveling exhibit called Enemy Alien Files, Hidden Stories of World War II. Um, I've been uh, an activist for, uh, I don't know, maybe about five decades now, you know, working on such issues as, you know, uh, community um, development and empowerment. People, if they know about um, the incarceration during World War II, they um, know about what happened to the Japanese American community, uh, the U.S. citizens and immigrant residents of Japanese ancestry uh, being interned in the 10 uh, war relocation authority camps. And it's, uh, they usually don't know about um, that there were thousands and thousands of other people, uh, both um, J uh, Nikkei, that were brought here from Latin America, but also the Germans and the Italians, uh, residents here in the U.S. and those that were also come from Latin America. And um, they were interned in a set of uh, 50 or more Department of Justice and Army camps. So when you realize what actually happened during World War II, the scope that of numbers, the numbers of camps, and the uh, violations that occurred is so much more than people realize. And then for my, uh, my family, my father was um, an immigrant resident of Peru. He went there when he was, um, I think, around 18 or so. He had hoped to come to join Japanese-American relatives here in the U.S., but because of the discriminatory and racist immigration laws, they were not allowed entry. So you had many folks going to Latin America, especially Peru. And um, during the war, um, our family and um, over 2,200 uh, pe pe men, women, and children were targeted during the um, uh, U.S.'s Latin American Extraordinary Rendition Program. Well. I was really struck by how um, dedicated they were to doing something about, you know, remembering our history and to um, bring it before the American people, even, you know, actually, and that we need to question the legality of it all and the constitutionality of it all and that kind of thing. So it was impressive that we're numerically a very small group. William Horry was one of these, you know, dedicated people. I mean, he was extremely smart and knowledgeable and all that. And, and so they decided to go the judicial route be, because that would really focus on all the violations that were committed by the government uh, of, of the basic uh, documents, and, you know, the Constitution and Bill of Rights and all those things. One group organized um, a, um, well, a mission to uh, address the uh, incarceration of Japanese Americans through the courts because uh, that addresses particular uh, violations of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and so it's just laid out in that manner which which of these um, laws were violated, and uh, I think it was like 14 different counts, 
And so I believe the redress that was asked for was like $10,000 per count. So uh, it would have been 140,000 per uh, person who had endured uh, the incarceration. And uh, it was done in, in a very American manner, which is to say, we go through the courts. And we got as far as the Supreme Court, which was fantastic. I mean, uh, just, why, you know, we, we as a group, we got to sit in on the session in which our case was argued. And it really was quite a thrill to, um, well, to think that we had made it up to that point to be able to sit in front of the justices and hear our case being uh, argued. It's, it's just showed that you know, a small group of people can, um, can actually accomplish things, you know? I mean, so we didn't win in the Supreme Court. That's okay. Um, the fact that we're in the books now and the fact that with the Coram Nobis cases that the Koromatsu was vacated and I think Hirabayashi case was, was also, I'm not quite sure the legal terminology, but all of those were acknowledged as being wrong or bad decisions. My name is Miles Ginoza. Um, I am half Japanese and half Filipino American. Um, I'm Yonsei, so fourth generation. And yeah, I got involved with the National Japanese American Historical Society. I think because I know very little about camp. Um, my dad told me that his parents only told him where they went to camp and they didn't tell him anything about their experience at all. And I think that was maybe their way of protecting him um, and maybe also their way of processing the trauma of that. Um, but yeah, as a result, I know very little about it. And so getting involved is, um, I think, a really good way for me to kind of understand, maybe anecdotally, um, what Japanese Americans went through. I think the redress movement for the Japanese Americans is a really important um, example in history and a lesson that people um, today of my generation can take moving forward. Um, you know, it started with a small group of people and through that they were enabled to um, gather more people and eventually enact change. And so in terms of issues today, whether that be, um, you know, Black Lives Matter or conversations about um, land reparations for Native Americans or just any issue um, that um, affects people, um, it doesn't take a lot of people to um, enact change. And I think. Um, it's just a, it's an important example in, in people power and the fact that um, um, organizing, you can create systems of care and support people, whether that be um, on the ground through mutual aid or um, for larger issues where you are organizing a lot of people for like national issues. I feel like there's, there can be certain uh, cultural specific struggles or like things that people sort of unite and bond over uh, coming from different uh, coming from different Asian uh, com Asian American communities Asian communities in doing this work I've learned that bottom line everyone just wants to feel accepted feel heard and feel a part of a community regardless of what it is so wherever you feel most comfortable, wherever you feel most safe. So learning that from this work and taking it towards my work with the Japantown Rainbow Coalition, the first step we believe is really just being able to fly a pride flag and show we're in solidarity with you, we see you, we 
uh, were comfortable being right there with you and having it be not just the Castro that you go to to embrace a certain part of yourself. You can be that, be all parts of yourself in, even in uh, Japantown. Sources that we didn't expect, or at least I certainly, uh, it sort of just blew past my mind was uh, were organizations like JARF, which, are, which is the uh, Japantown Religious Federation. Uh, Religious Federation. They w were very supportive. They came out directly as one of our first supporters writing a letter saying that they approved of a uh, pride flag going up in San Francisco, Japantown. They would uh, attend the ceremony, do a blessing, all that sort of thing. So it was a source of support that we weren't expecting, but I think really uh, helped us gain traction within uh, Japantown and the Japantown organizations. I'm 92 years old, and I think that what really keeps me going is because I'm very politically involved. You know, things make me angry or upset or something, and I don't feel that you just stew about it, you know, in isolation, but you go out and try to do something about it, you know. You don't have to, you know, be a marcher or anything like that, but there's a lot of little things you can do, like participate in elections, you know, like I write postcards and letters and um, contribute small amounts of money to, to various uh, candidates. Mm -hmm.